Welcome back, everyone, to SuperCloud 7. I'm John Furrier, host of here in Palo Alto with Rob Streche, Cube Research, and Dave Vellante, Chief Research Officer of the Cube Research and co-founder of Silicon Angle on the Cube. From Tel Aviv, we've got Jeff Denworth, the co-founder of Vast Data here, coming in live on the Cube. Jeff, great to see you. It's been a magical year for you guys at Vast, so congratulations first on all the success. You guys came out of stealth about a year ago uh, and on, been on a rocket ship, Vastronauts, as you guys call yourselves. Welcome back to the Cube. I would say uh, stealth is uh, stealth. We came out in 2019. We took the <laughs> covers off of the grand plan last year. So yeah, yeah thanks for having us. Yeah. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Great team you put together there. And again, the results um, pretty much well understood in the industry. You guys been on a growth tear. Welcome to SuperCloud 7. Our premise is that the survey data coming out from the landscape is all the work being done on the critical infrastructure, silicon, storage, networking to make data available faster at scale for generative AI has been the key thing. Now the data is actually pointing to the platform shift and the market shift in the data business. This is the key topic of SuperCloud 7. Uh, what's your reaction to that? You're living it, you're on the front wave of this. What are you seeing right now with this data shift and the market shift around data? Oh, we, well, we even see shifts within shifts. So uh, I think it's fair to say that Vast is um, kind of the embodiment of uh, a, a transformation in the market where People are now working on very intense AI workloads. We tend to sit at the center of the world's largest GPU environments. And we work obviously with NVIDIA and other partners to, to just build some magna magnificently large infrastructure. Um, but the, the thing that we've noticed over the last three months that's been really interesting is there are two new waves that are emergent. Um, one is the shift from uh, text-based to multimodal models has created, uh, I think the first kind of burn uh, in a two-phase strategy where you're just seeing this kind of boost in, in, in the amount of data that customers have to deal with. Um, and then the second is we're working with some of the organizations that are building super intelligent or artificial general intelligence systems. And these are organizations that are now processing exabytes of infrastructure. So um, the, only, the only direction is up in terms of the amount of data that these organizations are working with. Compare and contrast that to the old, where how databases have changed. I mean, a few years ago, we would be we were saying, oh, one database won't rule the world. Okay, that's happened. But you mentioned some of these use cases. The complexity is, is probably even off the charts. How do you tame the complexity? And what's changed in the market from a database perspective? What's the big fo focus on the change? How would, you, how would you categorize that if someone asked you, hey, what's the big deal? What is the core issue around what was old and what is now new? Sure, so um, I think we, we set out to make uh, data storage, database infrastructure, and computational infrastructure much simpler with an idea that people would want a lot uh, more kind of fast access to an endless amount of data. And that was kind of shown to us by some of the early work that was being done at places like Google and Meta and Baidu and Uber and Tesla. Um, and, and so, you know, fast forward to today that kind of chat GPT moment happened a few years ago. And uh, a few things have happened. One is file systems have seen a uh, renaissance just because now you have for the first time uh, a neural network and a processor that can derive context from unstructured data, right? So then, um, so that becomes the first part of it is that you need systems that support a modality of data types uh, or several modalities of data types. Um, and then the second thing is once you run the cat photo through the, um, the neural network and you derive an understanding of cat, uh, that it is a cat, then the second thing that happens is you need real-time systems that you can transact metadata into at massive levels of scale. And so this is why we, we stitched together uh, the world's most scalable file system with the world's first uh, exabyte scale transactional data warehouse together in something that we call the vast data platform as uh, a solution to the totality of AI pipelines that includes data preparation, data training, and uh, inference, data logging, and, um, and kind of data collection. And, and you see that people are not only just trying to train these models, but like you said, they have to do all that data preparation up front, and they have to do all the way through the fine tuning aspects of it as they go to bring these to production. And, and you're working with some of the largest uh, cloud service providers in this, and also some of the largest organizations in this. 
talk to us about how really you see that they're bringing this all together because they don't all start out with their data on VAST from that perspective. Right. So how are they bringing it together and what are the advantages they're seeing from that perspective? So, um, so I'll, I'll take any number of the kind of the born in the era of AI clouds that we work with. Let's talk about organizations like um, CoreWeave or, or Lambda or Core42 in the Middle East or, or Crusoe Cloud. Um, these are organizations that have built entirely new data center platforms for this new form of training at massive, massive scale. Um, but to your point, Rob, they, they, that's not where the data originates, right? And typically, uh, up until those AI clouds were built, you'd find kind of common data science pipelines that are used for data preparation, tools like Spark, Spark Data Frames, Spark SQL. Um, and then that data then um, now has to be moved to other data centers for processing uh, and training. And then there's a third tier of data centers, which are um, basically the, the remote locations that you want to do inference on. And all of this needs to be stitched together in a unified way. So we, we've built this ability to federate multiple clouds with something that we call the vast data space. And essentially it allows you to kind of flow all your files and all of your records that sit in tables across a series of independent cloud platforms so that you can have one unified pipeline. Yeah, so that's, we love that because we call it, of course, super cloud. But when I think of vast, Jeff, I think of, of architecture. We, we've seen the shared nothing architecture uh, grow over the last couple of decades. Architectures sort of always have trade-offs. They always hit their limitations. I wonder if you could give us a, a one-on-one on the vast architecture, maybe some of the limitations of, of, that you've talked about, I know before, but just to sort of refresh on some of the challenges of, of the east-west traffic and how you guys mm -hmm. have addressed that in your architecture. Yeah, it's actually pretty fundamental to the um, the value that we're increasingly seeing from our database platform. So, you know, uh, 2003, Google wrote a white paper about something called the Google file system, uh, where they solved for challenges of scale by basically taking commodity nodes and partitioning large namespaces across these nodes where each server would have some sort of uh, hard drives or SSDs and you stitch these together to build very, very large clusters, right? And so this solved the problem of really two problems. One is capacity scale. And then the other problem that these systems solved was the ability to read very, very large volumes of data, right? It became the, the basis for um, Hadoop subsequently after that paper was released. Um, now, what it's created is uh, a series of challenges, A, in terms of composability and B, in terms of um, not necessarily being able to transact into these systems with high performance because now all these nodes need to talk to each other through what you referred to, Dave, which is east-west traffic. And so as you scale up these systems, they get slower and slower and slower from a transactional perspective because there's more nodes that need to stay in content, constant contact with each other. Um, fast forward to 2015 or so, we started just um, talking to a number of different um, networking companies about a new network protocol that was going to come out that essentially made it possible to disaggregate CPUs from um, SSDs and you could build web scale systems out of this technology. And so um, so what we did is we, we basically split the cluster apart. And now you have um, a federation or a sea of stateless cores that run the software of the system. In, um, in just containers. And then all of the cores over this, this network can see one single volume of SSDs um, because we've built this essentially transactional data structure that allows for all of the cores to write and read into this volume without having to coordinate with each other. And so what comes of this is an ability to basically eliminate east-west traffic in hyperscale clusters and you know, fast forward to having uh, a distributed data warehouse that um, is transactional, as I mentioned earlier, the way that this gets achieved is by, um, by allowing for all of the independent machines to transact into that volume independently. Uh, and so the thing just scales like the bejesus. And um, as we're now adding uh, support for Kafka as a protocol, not necessarily as a system within our, our platform, you can stream data natively into the platform at any level of scale. And the second it hits the system, it's instantaneously correlatable using SQL against all of the data that goes all the way down to your archive. And so what we think we've done 
through this new architecture is completely closed the data availability and observability gap that exists in data lake and data lake house infrastructure. Yeah. Because now you can just do real time uh, streaming at any level of, of performance. Yeah. I'm glad you brought up streaming. I was going to ask the question around how you guys look at the, all the different diverse ingestion capabilities. Specifically, we look at the lake houses on the data lakes and you're basically integrating multiple data sources, whether it's a column of store database with something else, a lot of glue layers, makes sense. But the cost of streaming is huge. And we've heard that people are shying away from that because it's too much streaming. I'd rather just have a nice data lake. But you brought up some of those concerns on the data lake. How is VAS positioning itself differently? Because if you, saw, if you close the gap on ingestion with Kafka, what's the cost structure look like? What's the cost of ownership? What's the, what is it for the customer? Take us through, because that's the architectural problem that you're solving right now is, I want a lower cost, I don't want to stream everything all the time, um, but I want to actually be effective. Two. Yeah, um, there's, there's two things that we solve for. One is, A, you can stream at any level of scale, but B, the system is completely transactional. And so you could have millions of uh, records being written into the system in parallel, uh, hundreds of millions at, in, in you know, large scale cases, and that could even happen like updates across tables or um, you know, um, any number of like um, scaling use cases that, that typically you'd have to go and find an event bus for. Um, and so A, we had to solve for the parallel architecture and B, we had to build a tabular format that could support a lot of writers writing into a common table simultaneously. And so when you put that together, you just don't need an event bus anymore. Your lake is your, um, is your, your streaming engine, it is your, it is the thing that's your catcher's mitt within your data science pipeline. Um, and then our whole focus has always been around making Flash so much more affordable than it's ever been, such that customers get an experience that's no different than um, than what you'd see for like an archive. And so then the question becomes is if, if price isn't the issue with Flash anymore, do you build data warehouse infrastructure and database infrastructure in the same ways that you used to that answer, as best as we can tell, is decidedly no. And by solving for the IO bottlenecks of conventional data science pipelines, what we're showing the world is you can get anywhere between a two to a 20X improvement in pipeline performance. Now, my general perspective is that most of the data science industry is not interested in solving this problem because everybody sells by the core. And um, so there's a conflict of interest with respect to optimization that we just threw right out the window. So Very Jeff, disruptive. Jeff, the previous guest, Jamak Tagani, talked about, she did a really good job of laying out the complexity of today's data pipelines and then injecting AI into that conversation, which of course makes this worse. So how are you seeing your customers address that, that challenge? Are they sort of rethinking the data pipelines? Or are you just making it such that a lot of those uh, difficulties and challenges that they face today go away because of that sort of integrated architecture that you just described? So I think we try very hard to be non-disruptive. That means standard protocols, all the data types that customers are accustomed to dealing with. And at the architecture level, we make it possible to simplify and consolidate and accelerate. And so in this regard, um, customers are very rarely completely rethinking their pipelines. They're rather just getting uh, simplified data models and accelerants that, that we deliver to them uh, as a way to making infrastructure a lot more easy uh, and and much more cost effective. So, so yeah, I, I don't I don't see a full rethink happening uh, across the customers that we're working with. But you know, obviously, when you start talking about things like Gen AI pipelines and RAG models, like there's just a whole bunch of new stuff that's also coming into the market that you have to um, also accommodate for. So, so we talk a lot about the um, the synthesis of AI and BI, uh, and and what we find is that most BI teams are now graduating up to also being AI platform practitioners just because they're the ones that understand pipelines better than anybody else in the company. Yes, yeah, so you say not disruptive, Rob and John, to the to the customer, but maybe to the industry. Okay. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that to me also is one of the big things is the personas that you're talking to and because it's not just about really uh, the, the big CSPs and stuff like that, but it's the, the people that are working on top of those CSPs, plus the ones that are uh, really digging in those corporations. And they have, they have to make a trade off, right? Between that capacity and performance where they've had to in the past. From your perspective where you have these different personas, you're also working with many different partners outside of the CSPs. 
how are they wrapping their heads around how they build out this infrastructure? Because that's one of the things we've seen, and I think Dave hit on it a little bit earlier, is that cost has really gone up for people looking at their ROI out of Gen AI. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think the thing to understand is why we work with CSPs first. Um, and, you know, uh, Jensen actually explained this to me in a way that it made a lot of sense. But uh, if you think about Blackwell, um, you've got 120 kilowatts of, of power required for each data center rack. So the conversation, you know, we kind of used um, Johnson & Johnson as in just a, uh, an example, like, you know, the Johnson & Johnsons of the world probably don't have that amount of cumulative power such that they can build this like really, really large system. So the thing that CSPs have more than um, anything else is, is power. Uh, and, and the ability to build uh, scalable and reliable infrastructure really quickly. And so they become the destination for next generation enterprise workloads that simply aren't um, able to be deployed in uh, a customer's four walls. Um, and so if, if we think about that, then um, then those CSPs and, and pretty much all AI pipelines around the world now need to be up-leveled with respect to data management um, rigor, uh, security and um, obviously, if there's opportunities to simplify, you have to. It's uh, it's incumbent upon you because everybody's talking about you know the value of AI and everything that we can do to bring down the delivered cost of infrastructure is all to the betterment of making the ROI models on these product uh, projects much better. But the interesting thing is um, is uptime is is probably the the most critical concern for these large large language model builders and deployers because. Uh, somebody did uh, the math on um, 100,000 GPU cluster, which is now a size of system that's starting to creep into the market. You're talking about an MTBF of every 18 minutes, right? And so <laughs> making these systems available is is table stakes for getting to the ROI model. Um, and, and that's why we, we really focus on building robustness into systems first and yeah. foremost. Performance and availability are great, great feature. Jeff, great to have you on the Cube. I know last year we were talking all year on the Cube, riffing, and you guys, you, I think you were on the Cube when we talked about an operating system for data. Where's the Linux for data? You guys are really taking a crack at this operating system for AI. Love what you guys do. As you guys look forward, agents are hot right now, app, intelligent applications. I can see the dots connecting. Share your vision for how you see as you have availability, you're activating data. What does the agent apps look like out there? What's your vision? Well, we're we're uh, we're a data company, not an agent company, right? Okay. But what's very clear to us is that um, there is a ton of information that can't fit into a model, uh, and there's a ton of data that customers may never choose to put inside that model for security purposes, and so, in essence, what we see is just a massive opportunity. To, uh, to go and index the world's data. If you think about a system with deep roots and unstructured data as vast as, taking that data and building it into uh, a corpus that can be basically interfaced with by large language models is absolutely uh, something that we're super excited about and I can't say anything more about. Well, we'll, we'll be digging into it. <laughs> Jeff, thanks for coming in from Tel Aviv. Have a great night and thank you for your time. We appreciate you. We know you're super busy. And again, congratulations to the VAST team and your and your team, the VAST astronauts as you call them. Thanks for participating. Thanks guys. Thanks Jeff, be safe. Okay, SuperCloud yeah. 7 continues after this short break. We'll be back with more great lines. We're going to unpack the survey of all surveys coming out from the Cube Research here in Palo Alto. We'll be right back.